right, I am a registered nurse. I have been a nurse since 1973. So that means I've been a nurse for 36 years. 36 years. That's how old I am. 36 years. So you're born the year I graduated. Okay. <laughs> how, many, how many weren't born when I graduated from nursing school? Okay. So I've been a nurse for 36 years. So uh, it's been good to me. It's been a great profession. I, I will have to admit that in 1973 in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, that was the steel mill closings. We were in a really big recession up there. And it took me three and a half months to find my first job as a nurse. But ever since then, I've had a minimum of two jobs going on at the same time. I've never been unemployed, never lost a job, always had at least two jobs going on. So it's a great, it, even in an economic downtime like is now, uh, your first job might be a little hard to find, but after that, it, it works pretty well. So it's been good to me, good to my family. Uh, I, I love it. I like to teach it. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. I try to stay uh, current as well, you know, in practice, work in nursing as well as teach in nursing. The last two years I haven't been able to work in nursing because these reviews have just taken over my life. I have every weekend I'm somewhere, which is I'm not complaining. That's great. It's just I'm going to have to start saying no to some things <laughs> eventually. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm basically educated as a med surge nurse. But I also teach psych, and I've worked in psych, so I know psych. Um, I also do farm, and I have graduate education in testing and measurement and cross-cultural nursing, transcultural nursing. Anybody ever hear of Madeline Leininger? Some right state people should have heard of Leininger. Do you hear of her? She was my advisor, so um, I'm an expert in cross-cultural and stuff like that. Uh, let's see. I've worked a lot of ICU. A lot of ER, step-down units. Uh, I usually have the idea that if something scares me, I go at it. So I was scared of neuro, so I first started working in neuros. Then I was afraid of being able to read EKGs and rhythm strips, so I went into coronary care and learned that. And everything, you can learn anything. Just don't avoid, don't, don't ever think you can't learn something or that something's too hard for you. Just go at it, you'll find that it's not a big deal. Uh, See what else? I have a wife, four daughters. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> I better shut my cell phone off. It's Friday. Okay, what the goal is here, while we're together, I have three objectives. Three objectives. First, I want you to acquire some knowledge. I want you to learn something. I want you to go out that door and go, boy, I learned something today. Because I don't assume that everybody knows everything. And it doesn't hurt to learn some new information every once in a while. And I know enough about nursing to know that every graduate doesn't know everything they could know for this board. So there's some information that you need to know for boards that you do not know. Now, it's different for everybody. Not everybody has that same deficit. You have one that someone else doesn't have and vice versa. But I want you to acquire some knowledge. Some reviews, you don't learn anything. All they do is they just do multiple choice questions. And you're learning how to apply it. Well, that assumes you know it. And you can't apply what you don't know. So a lot of good it, it does to sit there and try to apply something if you don't know what they're talking about in the first place. To me, that's a waste of time. And I've worked in nursing long enough education to know that students don't know everything that they probably should know. They've forgotten some stuff. So we're going to try to spiff up your knowledge and I want you to acquire some knowledge. Secondly, I want you to gain confidence. I want you to, when you walk out of here, go, you know, I, I can do this. This is something that I can do. Uh, because I think one of the biggest fears that people have is that they're going to fail because somehow, some way, they're the one person in the universe that this is just beyond their capabilities. Do you know what I mean? Now, everybody else will be able to do it, but they will not. For some inexplicable reason it's beyond their capabilities and the yeah, I got through school yeah, and I got through that but when I go to the boards it's just gonna get me those standardized tests are just gonna get me and you don't want to go there okay so 
I want you to have confidence that you've done everything that you humanly possibly could have done when you sit down to take that boards. Because the worst case scenario is you go to boards, and you know some of your friends, some of your classmates don't do any reviewing for boards. They just go take it. Well, that's okay, but can you imagine yourself, you sit down for boards, and you sign your name in and you click go and it's, it brings up the first question and suddenly you realize you haven't done anything to prepare for this. Could you imagine how you would feel if you had not done a thing to prepare? You, they may be, your friends that aren't taking review classes might be confident now. I'd like to talk to them when, they, when that first question pops up and say, hey, would you think you might want to do something? But then it's too late. So when you sit down to click and start taking that test, I want you to realize that you've done everything you possibly could have done. And, and you did what is above and beyond reasonability. And you can have that confidence that you've done your part. Secondly, I want you to become exam proficient, meaning I want you to know how to take tests. Because earlier I just said you can't apply what you don't know, but you have to be able to apply what you do know. So it takes three things to pass boards, knowledge, confidence, and skill in taking exams. So this review is designed to address all three of those points. Have you acquire some knowledge, gain some confidence, and gain some exam proficiency. When you walk out of here on Sunday, I want you to think, you know, I know how to do those select all the applies. I know how to do those click and drags. I know how to do prioritization questions, delegation questions, staff management questions, uh, best questions, first questions, uh, all those kinds of different formats. I want you to be able to do point and click and all of those. So we'll be talking about that. I, I really believe that any review, some, there are two types of reviews out there. If you've had reviews, you know this, is some reviews just sit there and they give you a book that's an outline what do they do? They read it to you. I don't know about you guys, but I haven't enjoyed being read to since I was seven. You know? So I would just immediately go to sleep. And after the first break, I'd probably just leave. Figuring I can read it at home. I don't need somebody to read to me. And then third, second, and then the other kind of review is, like I said before, they, they have just this, this whole bank of multiple choice questions. And all they do is they flash it up on the screen and they say, okay, you got, you know, 30 seconds to do this question. So everybody sits there, you know, and they say, okay, we're done. And of course, Susie Anal Retentive over here says, it's B. You know, and then all of a sudden now you guys, your thought process is contaminated because she shouted out the answer and now you, do you know what I'm saying? You, and it messes up the whole process and then you're supposed to learn from that and then then this person starts arguing with the teacher that they, they didn't think that was the right answer and then it takes up 20 minutes arguing about some stupid question and you're going oh let me out of here you know I just, it's, this is just ridiculous what's that that's our class okay so it just to me that doesn't neither one of those models works because two things you can't apply what you don't know but you have to be able to apply what you do know and if all they give you is a lecture you don't get a chance to apply it and if all they do is apply it you don't get a chance to learn it so the, I think the uniqueness about my review if there is uniqueness and I believe there is is that it hits both of those. I hit a balance between applying and learning, applying and learning. So that's sort of where we're headed, what we're doing now. So I made this blue book. I want you to do the blue book. Um, doing the blue book is part and parcel of the, of the review. If you haven't done the review book, you have not done Mark Clemick's review. You've only done half of it. Because that blue book is a drill book to teach you facts. Facts, facts, facts. When people don't pass boards, I usually sit down with them when they come to me, and I'll sit down with them and see if they know what they're talking about. And we are, we'll sit down and start doing some questions. We probably aren't 10 questions into that 
and I've already taken them to the blue book like three or four times. Because they'll read something and they go, oh, I don't know what that is. Let's get out the blue book. Okay, there it is, page 52. What's it say? Oh, okay, well then it's A. Yeah, it's A. Do you see what I'm saying? So get that blue book out. All you have to do to pass this test is do a little less than average. How many of you in here is it possible that you could achieve a little less than average on a test? See, so you don't have to do how well on this test. Do you have to do well on this test? No. Do you have to do average on this test? No. You need to do a little less than average on this test to pass. So don't think that you, you've got some insurmountable standard that you have to hit. And then you say, well then why do people fail? Because they think they have to be up here. You see what I'm saying? And they study that way, and they, they get anxious that way, and it just doesn't work. Okay, acid base is something you do have to know about. If you do not know acid base, you are in trouble because everybody else knows about acid base. Okay? So, two, one thing you have to do in acid base is if they give you an arterial blood gas value report, you have to interpret it as metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis. So if they give you lab values, you have to convert it to words. Now if you know how to do that, you're 100% accurate, go for it, don't listen to me, I don't want to fix what isn't broken. But if you're confused about that, you're nervous about it, you're anxious about it, I've got something here that might help you. Okay. All right, interpreting blood gases, the first thing I suggest you memorize is the rule of the bees. Do you see it there? The rule of the bees. And what I want you to do that is fill in here. It says, if the pH, that fills your first blank in. And as I say, there's only 3,000 to go. Okay, so if the pH and the bicarb, the pH and the bicarb are both, in the same direction, then it's metabolic. So the B's are bicarb both bolic. Do you see those bicarb both bolic? The reason why this works is respiratory does not have a letter B in it. Bicarb has the B in it. So what I'm saying is this, they will give you an arterial blood gas with eight values in it. How many do you look at? They'll give you eight values. How many do you look at? Two. Which two? pH and the bicarb. That's what the rule says. Just look at the pH, look at the bicarb. Then look to see what direction they're going. If they're both in the same direction, be it up or down, it doesn't really matter. As long as they're both in the same direction, who cares what direction, then you must use what adjective? Metabolic. Metabolic. Because the rule says if the pH <coughs> and the bicarb are both in the same direction, it's metabolic. Bob. Well, what if they're in different directions? Respiratory. Then you only have one other choice, and that's respiratory. Now, where do you get the acidosis and alkalosis from? The pH. The pH. Exactly. So let's look at how this rule would work. Well, first we have to know the normals. What's the normal pH? 7.35, 7.45. That is a piece of universal nursing knowledge. Everyone knows that. If you do not know that, you're the only nurse in the universe that doesn't know it. No, I'm serious. <laughs> okay, the normal bicarb is 22 to 26. Not every nurse knows that, so learn that. 22, 26. I call them the bicarb years. When you're 22 to 26 year olds and you have to make all those decisions. Where do, what job do I take? Who do I, who's my buddy? Am I gonna get married? Am I not gonna get married? Am I gonna move in, not move in? You know, all those in decisions you got to make when you're 22 to 26. That gives you heartburn. So you need the bicarb. I call it the bicarb years because you're always in a knot over decisions. It's nice to be 56. No choices. <laughs> no other women watch it. You're, no jobs watch it. It's, like you're, it's nice. You only got one option. Makes it a nice question. Our teacher told us to remember that 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 6. That's true, but what does that mean? Oh, it's okay, 2 way. plus 2 plus 2. Oh, 22 to 26. 2, 2, 2, 6. Oh, that's cool. That's, like that. that's good. A lot of 2, so. Lots of 2. Bicarb. 
So two, 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 six. Right. Now, let's look at those, and let's look at our examples. In the first example, the pH is in what direction? Down. Down, so draw a little arrow down in the box next to it. Then the rule says to look at what? The bicarb. The bicarb. And the bicarb in this case is in what direction? Down. Down. So draw a little arrow down. Are those arrows going in the same direction? Yes. So what adjective must you use? Metabolic. Metabolic. And because the pH is down, it is? Acidosis. So that is an example of? Metabolic, metabolic acid. acidosis. Okay, look at letter B. Bicarb is in, I mean, the pH is in what direction? Up, bicarb, up. Are they both in the same direction? Yeah. Yes. So what adjective must you use? Metabolic. metabolic. So this is metabolic alkalosis. Wait, is everybody with me? Okay, the next one, pH is down, bicarb is up. Are they both in the same direction? No. So what adjective can you not use? Metabolic. Metabolic. So you have to use respiratory. So this would be respiratory acidosis. Now the only time this doesn't work is when there's a mixed acid-base disorder and Bohr's doesn't go there. Because that's way too hard. All right. So if the pH of, does everybody see how the rule works? What if I gave you a, bicar a pH, pH of 7.50? And a bicarb of 25. 750 and 25. What would it be? Respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis. Why? Because the pH is in one direction. Is low. Well, 750 I mean, would be it's up. It's up. Yeah. And the bicarb is yeah. normal. 25. It's normal. 25. So is that the same direction? Up and normal? No. So it's got to be respiratory. Sorry. So even if the bicarb is normal, it still works. You see what I'm saying? All right, that's the ABG interpretation. Let's talk about signs and symptoms, letter B. They will ask, they will tell you a patient has respiratory acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, something like that, and they'll say, what would you see? Select all that apply. And you get a whole laundry list of stuff, and you have to select, check, 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 what's true. Well, two things here. One thing here, I hate lists. One thing you're going to see in my review is I do not have you memorizing lists of things. I hate lists. I despise lists. I refuse to remember lists. The reason why I hated lists in school was for two reasons. First reason I hated lists is, for example, if I learned 15 signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia and then 15 signs and symptoms of hypokalemia, when I took the test, guess what would happen? I'd memorized, I would remember the lists, word for word. I could reproduce the list, but I would forget which one was which. Do you see what I'm saying? And when that happens, you're dead. All that work went for nothing. The second reason why I hated lists was, even if I could remember which was which, and all 15 signs, my teachers had the tendency to pick signs number 16, 17, 18 and 19, and not the 15 that I memorized. And one thing that you guys learned real early in nursing is every book says something different, right? Take two nursing books, same thing, look at the list, the lists aren't the same, right? Have you ever find two, found two lists that were the same for anything in nursing? Never. So you can memorize a whole bunch of lists, but for that to be productive on boards, it better be what? the list that boards is using, right? And what chances is that? Very slim. So the point is this, boards does not test your knowledge of lists. It does not. What boards tests is your knowledge of principles, not lists. But how will they test your knowledge of principles? By having you generate lists. Do you understand what I'm saying? Boards will not test your knowledge of what? Lists. They test your knowledge of? Principles. But they will test your knowledge of principles by having you generate lists. lists. 
And so when people take boards, they say, oh, you gotta memorize a whole bunch of lists. No, you don't. They don't know what's going on. For example, uh, in general, what do pain meds do? In general, what do pain, opioid pain medications do in principle to a person? What do they do? They sedate you, don't they? They're CNS depressants. Okay, now, they will ask a question like, your patient is on Dilaudid, an opioid analgesic. What of the following things would you expect to see if they got too much or that they you know, were getting a little too much? Select all that apply. All righty. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, I don't remember the list of Dilaudid signs. It's not a list of Dilaudid signs. It's to see if you know that opioid analgesics are CNS depressants, sedatives. So when you go to the list, what do you select? Agitation or lethargy? Lethargy. <laughs> Flaccidity or spasticity? Flacidity. Reflexes of plus one or plus four? Plus one. Plus one. Hyperreflexia, hyporeflexia? Hypo. Hyporeflexia. You know, uh, restlessness or obtunded? Well, you go, I know what restless is. That's up, so obtunded must be down. down. That's a good test taker right there, okay? And you say, obtunded. Okay, a good test taker never says, what? They say, hmm. <laughs> and then they figure it out the other way. Think about you guys that aren't good test takers. You haven't figured out that those good test takers, they don't know anything. They're not. They don't know anything more than you know. In fact, they probably know less than you know. They just don't quit. They just figure out, oh, I'll get it. There's... Uh, if they won't let me in the front door, I'll go in the back door. And if the back door's closed, I'll go through the cellar window. And they'll figure a way to get at it. They just don't quit. Poor test takers go, oh, I don't know what that. No. I just knew there was a really bad test taker. He, he came to a, uh, a maternity question, and it said, what's the best way to treat morning sickness in a first trimester woman? And he said, oh, this is the only OB question I know the answer to. It's crackers. <laughs> and he was so excited that he got the one OB thing he did not. So it's crackers, crackers. He looks A didn't say crackers, B didn't say crackers, C didn't say crackers, and D didn't say crackers. And what did he say as a bad test ticket? What did he say? Oh my goodness. I thought I what? Knew this. I guess I don't know this. So he picked something like antacids every half hour. Okay. And then he wonders why he doesn't do very well. Well, you know what number C said? You know what answer number C said? Dry carbohydrates. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is a dry carbohydrate? Cracker. A cracker. But what did he do? <gasps> oh! You know, he was expecting the front door. Cracker. No, you go in the back door. Dry carbohydrate. Do you see what I'm saying? Don't give up. Don't think that you don't know this. You know it. Okay, so if they say restless versus obtunded, you know what restless is. Obtunded must be the other. Okay, but do you see what I'm saying about the sedation? And, and, and you generate the list by applying the what? Principle, not having memorized some list. Does that make sense? Do you see why boards can't, why can't boards test lists? Why can a national nursing test not test lists? Because why? All the lists are different in different textbooks used in different geographical areas of the nation. To write a statistically significant, reliable, valid question, you have to write the question so that no matter who takes it, no matter what book they read, no matter what school they went to, it's a fair question. And if you're just a, taking out a Mosby's book on whatever, the signs and symptoms of whatever, and you write a question on that, it, won't, it, it will perform horribly, statistically, nationally. The only way you can do these select all that applies and have them perform well is to test what? Principles and see if a student can generate a list from a principle. Now does that change the way you might look at a select all that apply question? You understand what they're about? There is no mystery. You weren't supposed to have memorized some mystery list that you didn't know. You're supposed to say, this is a chance for me to show I know a principle. You got that? That's how you do those. Okay, um, let's, so I want to give you a principle for answering acid-based signs and symptoms. 
and it's what's in the box there. It says as the, you see where I'm at? As the pH goes, so goes my patient. As the pH goes, so goes my patient. What? What does that mean? As the pH goes. pH can go up or the pH can go down. down. And when the pH goes up, your patient goes up. And when the pH goes down, your patient goes down. Does that mean they sink and levitate? <laughs> well, what does it mean? What's it mean? Talk to me. Yeah, so when the pH goes up, every system in your body gets more irritable. But when your pH goes down, systems in your body shut down. So when your pH goes down, you shut down. When your pH goes up, everything gets hyper excitable. It's pure chemistry. It's talking about catal catal you know, catalyzing chemical reactions, basically. So do you see where it says up? Oh, except for potassium. Sorry, I didn't write that in there. Except for potassium. So what does that mean? And when pH goes down, potassium goes up. Because if it followed the rule, we wouldn't even mention it, right? So as the pH goes, so goes my patient except for potassium. So if your patient goes up, do you see the little box there that says up? What is that? All? What's another name for that? Up pH? Alkalosis. What will you see with alkalosis? Give me some stuff. Give me some signs you'd see with alkalosis. Irritability, Irritability absolutely. Hyperreflexia. Hyper what would be some numbers that would be hyperreflexic? What numbers? Three and four. Three and four are hyper. Two is normal. One and zero are hypo. Remember that with reflexes? Three and four are high, hyper. Two is normal reflex and one to zero is hypo reflex. What else would you see with alkalosis? You got two of them. We got irritable, we got hyperreflexia. What else do you think? Think of a body system and then go a high. Tachypnea. What else? Tachycardia. Would you have paralytic ileus or borborygmy? Good. You good test taker said borborygmy. Even though you may not know what it is, because paralytic ileus sounds like everything's what? Shutting down. That would be the down. The up would be borborygmy. Now, Boards loves the word borborygmy. B O R B O R Y G M I. Borborygmy. That is the word they will use for increased vowel sounds. <laughs> So if you hear somebody's stomach growling this evening, what will you say? How borborygmus. <laughs> Borborygmy. Increased vowel sound. Can you spell that one more time? B-O-R, and do it again, B-O-R, Y-G-M-I. Borborygmy. So what would be down? Acidosis, and what would you see there? What's that? Hyporeflexia. What else? Bradycardia. Lethargy. By the way, obtunded means just one step more lethargic than lethargy. O B T U N D E D. Obtunded. Vocabulary is critically important to pass this test. That's why the blue book and the yellow book are real heavy on both vocab. Can't answer a question if you don't know what the words mean. Sounds pretty obvious. So what would you have? Paralytic ileus or borboring me? Paralytic ileus. Would they have a seizure or a coma? Coma. Coma. The seizure's up, coma's down. You gotta go the same as the pH. So uh, let me ask you this: What acid, what acid-base imbalances 
are most likely to seize and which ones are most likely to have a respiratory arrest? Alkalosis will what? Seize and acidosis will respiratorily arrest. Does that make sense? Because you're doing it as the pH goes, so goes your patient. So what acid-base disorders need an AMBU bag at the bedside? What acid-base imbalances need an AMBU bag at the bedside? Acidosis. Acidosis, because they're going to what? Respiratorily arrest. Which acid-base disorders need suction machines at the bedside? Alkalosis, because they could seize and aspirate. See, so you, you don't limit yourself. When they start asking these things, say, wait a minute, I know about this. I can get there. See, I shouldn't have to teach you who needs an AMBU bag at the bedside. You should be able to get that from as the pH goes, so goes my patient. Do you see what I'm saying? These rules, use them. They're tools. Okay. Uh, before we turn the page, I want to ask you, I want to introduce you to... Uh, whoa, that's bright. Don't look at the light. Is that coming in clear? Or, oh, duh. <laughs> I want to introduce you to my favorite Scotsman. You know how Scottish surnames have Mac, Dougal, McDonough, MacGyver, MAC, you know? My favorite Scotsman, Mac Kuzma. How many have heard of Kuzmals? Okay, from now on, I want you to, every time you see Kuzmal, I want you to think what? Oh, yeah. Matt Kuzmal. In fact, if you're talking to a doctor and he goes, he's Matt Kuzmal, I'll be happy. It'll make you look stupid, but I'll be happy. The reason is, is Kuzmals is a compensatory respiratory pattern for one and only one acid-base disorder. You only see Kuzmals with one of the four metabolic disorders, one of the four acid-base disorders. Which one? Well, MAC tells you that. M for what? And AC for acidosis. So MAC Kuzmo tells you that you see Kuzmo's with metabolic acidosis. Okay, we have some knowledge, but we have to be able to what? Apply it. Remember, you can't apply what you do not know, but what you know, you have to be able to apply. This says, your patient has respiratory acidosis. Select all that apply. Plus one reflexes. Diarrhea. A dynamic ileus. Spasm. Urinary retention. Paroxysmal. Atrial. Tachycardia, second degree, Mobitz, type 2, <coughs> heart block, and hypokalemia. I want you guys to get in groups 2 and 3 right where you're sitting, you know, come on. I want you to talk to somebody, your buddy, and I want you to answer this question. And I want you to use the rule that I taught you. The rule is what? As the pH goes, so goes my patient, except for potassium. Now, I really want you to draw some arrows here. I want you to draw arrows, okay? And I want you to get the answer. 
So you can do it yourself and turn to your buddy, discuss it, and then we'll talk about it. And don't say any answers out loud. Plus one reflexes yeah. would be down, so it would be down. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. I go down. Adding not Nomic Elias. That would be a uh, high. So that is a good pick up. Hypokalemia. Wait a minute now, that's a, that's different though. That's yeah. a, that's dynamic is high. Except for potassium. So if it goes down, that means the potassium's up. So it, so I guess it would be down, low is down. So it would probably be that. Okay, I want you to count the Check number of things you select. Don't say it yet, but I'll ask you for it later. I'm going to count the number you select. Yeah, so what was the number for the down? Down is to zero to one. Zero to one. So that is check is the two was normal two normal yeah. okay how many did you select how many did you get three. I got three I know I don't know yeah, how many did you select three. Four. Four. three you should have selected four. four so let's play our game what did you automatically notice about this question it said what Acidosis. Acidosis, the pH is in what direction? Down. Down. And everything's going to go the same direction, which is what direction? Down. Except for potassium, which is going to go? Up. So a high K. So now there's your answer. Now, up or down? Down. down. Select or no select? Select. Yes. Up or down? Up. Select or no select? No. No. A dynamic, without movement. Up or down? Down. 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 Select or no select? Select. Select. Spasm, up or down? Uh, select or no select? Uh, Urinary retention? Down. 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 Select. Paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, select or no? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. Mobitz type 2 heart block, yes or no? Yes. Why? So. Block means the impulse is being what? Uh, Slow, blocked, it's down, it's being hindered. So that's a select. Hypokalemia? No, I want a high K, not a low K. So the answer is the plus one reflex, the A dynamic ileus, the urinary retention, and the second degree of is type two heart block. How many got that right? Excellent, excellent. Did you memorize the list? No? How long would the list be before you got second degree of is type two heart block? <laughs> right? So that's what, and they're testing what principle? What principle are they testing? That in an acidotic environment, chemical reactions cease. So everything shuts down, and that's why you do it, see? They aren't, they, you weren't supposed to have memorized these. Do you see what my point is? So this should kind of free you from the fear of these, these select all that applies. Oh, by the way, what's the number one prop? mistake that people make with select all that apply. Most common mistake made with select all that apply questions. <coughs> Not even Selecting one more than you should have selected. <laughs> Number one problem. Now, those of you who are real concrete people, I did not say answer what you think and take away what. Okay, I didn't say that. I said that the tendency for people is to answer what? One more than they should. So here's the deal. With the select all that apply, if you know it's two of them, what do you do? Select those two and what? 
stop. Because if you go, well, you know, it could be, oh, okay, now that's a killer <laughs> on select all and apply. You know, could be, don't go there with select all and apply. That is not cool because you're, you're heading down a road that's going to get you too wrong. If you do not know that it's, it applies, do not answer select all the, you know what I'm saying? If you don't know that, if you don't know that this is true, then don't pick it. Is that making sense? All right, uh, the other thing about select all that apply, it's never only one and it's never all of them. You see what I'm saying? Never answer just one on a select all that apply and don't answer all of them on a select all that apply because it's never one and it's never all of them. Okay, let's go to the next page. Causes of acid base imbalance, causes. What they'll do is they'll give you a scenario and they'll say, this is what's happening to your patient. And then they'll say, what acid-base disorder would result from this? Do you see they're, they're, flipping the, they're flipping it around. Instead of saying, what sign and symptom will the acid-base balance cause, they're asking, what will cause the acid-base imbalance? And one thing that people do wrong when they answer these kinds of questions is they get signs and symptoms and causation messed up. Do you realize that in the human body, oftentimes what causes something is the opposite of what the signs and symptoms of that thing are? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So a lot of times what will happen is diarrhea will cause a metabolic acidosis. But once you get acidotic, it will shut your bowels down and you will get a paralytic ileus. You see, one diarrhea caused it, paralytic ileus results from it. It's the opposite. And when you're sitting there going, man alive, I learned it was this, and now you're telling me the opposite, probably what are you messing up? Causation, Causation versus sign and symptoms. So make sure that you, many times if you go back and you do questions now and you get confused, think, wait a minute, wait a minute, are you talking about sign and symptom, or are they talking about causation? Then you can go, oh, I see where the problem is. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so um, just keep that straight. Okay, having said that, we're talking about causation now. Whenever you get a scenario, the first big question you ask yourself is, is it lung? That goes in the first blank. Is it lung, L-U-N-G? Is the scenario a lung scenario? If the scenario they give you is a lung scenario, guess what kind of a problem it is? Respiratory. It's respiratory. I mean, it can't be any easier than that. However, that only gives you a 50-50 because it could be respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis, correct? Well, how do you tell between those? Well, the second question you ask yourself is, is the client overventilating or underventilating? Is the client or patient overventilating or underventilating? That is going to be critical for your respiratories. If the patient is overventilating, pick alkalosis. If they are underventilating, pick acidosis. Now this is extremely simple. It's almost pathetically simple. Are these not the only four options you have to choose from when you combine them to make these imbalances? Mm -hmm. It's either metabolic or respiratory, it's either acidosis or alkalosis, right? So you're choosing between these four words, correct? Well, let's look to see how this works. If the client is overventilating, let's take the word ventilate. Which of these three words fits best with the idea of ventilating? Exactly. Now, we're left with what? Over. Of the remaining three words, which word has the closest connection to something being over? Why alkalosis? Because it's over the normal. So that's alkalosis. So if you put them together, ventilating over becomes respiratory alkalosis. 
See how easy that is? And if I say the patient is under ventilating, what does vent become? Respiratory. What does under become? Acid, because that's under the normal. So under vent becomes respiratory acidosis. You see, you're just translating. You're just translating. See that? How many understand what I'm saying? Okay, do you see how easy this is? You're simply translating. So when they say overventilate, you say, oh, respiratory alkalosis. Underventilate, respiratory acidosis. So let me ask you this. They give you a scenario, scenario where a woman is overzealously using her breathing techniques during labor. She's really overzealously using those breathing techniques. What acid-based disorder would she rep, uh, exhibit? Well, is that lung? Yes, she's over, she's breathing techniques. Overzealously using breathing, so that's lung. Is she overventilating or underventilating? Oh, overventilating, you translate that to mean <coughs> respiratory alkalosis, and that would be your answer. You have a child who was a victim of near drowning what acid-base disorder would it be? Well, is that a lung scenario, near drowning? Mm -hmm. Yes? It, would the kid have been overventilating or underventilating when he was nearly drowning? Under. under, so he would have respiratory acidosis. Your patient has emphysema and air trapping. Is that lung? Yeah. Yeah. Is he overventilating or underventilating? Under. under, so he would respiratory acidosis. Yes. Be careful, ventilating doesn't mean respiratory rate. The respiratory rate is irrelevant here. Everybody pays way too much importance to the respiratory rate. Do you understand that ventilation has to do with gas exchange, not respiratory rate? For example, I could say that a person had uh, pneumonia in five lobes of their lung, four lobes of the lung. Pneumonia in four lobes. They're breathing at 50 a minute, and their SAO2 is 78 on eight liters per mask. You got it? What's, what's, what do they have? Pneumonia in four lobes. They're breathing really fast, but their SEO2 is really <coughs> low. Now, is that person overventilating or underventilating? Under. under, even though their rate is 50, because rate has nothing to do with it, and everybody pay so much attention to rate, they miss these questions right and left and under, don't understand why. Because you're paying attention to the wrong piece of information. It's not about the rate, it's about the SAO2. Would you agree with me that if your SAO2 is good and you're breathing slow, you're fine, but if you're breathing fast and your SAO2 is low, you're actually underventilating? So the rate can be tricky. So what am I trying to tell you? When you get asked base disorder questions, what piece of data in the question is real shaky to use to get your answer? Respiratory, Respiratory rate. rate. Because a lot of times it compensates, which means does the opposite, so you'll totally get the wrong answer. You see what I'm saying? Pay attention to what? SAO2. Right. Um, somebody's on a PCA pump. What acid base imbalance would tell you that maybe they need to come off that thing. They're on a PCA pump. What acid-based disorder would tell you they need to come, maybe come off that thing? Well, you say, okay, well, PCA pump, what, what do you know about PCA pumps? They what? Depress respirations. Why would they need to come off of it if they were, what? Getting too much, which would make my respiratory rate go really what? My ventilations go really down, which would mean I would be under ventilating, so the answer would be respiratory acidosis. So respiratory acidosis would tell you that maybe you need to back off that PCA pump. Is that making sense? And see, those are questions you may not have even thought you know the answer to, but you can get the answer if you just calm down and use it, because this is a what? It's a tool. So use the tools at your disposal. Don't say, I can't get the screw out, and the screwdriver's still sitting in the box. You know, grab the screwdriver and try to get it out. So many times I teach people tools on how to take tests and everything, and then I do test questions with them, and they leave the tools in the box. You know what I'm saying? Get the tools out. Start using them. 
Um, what if it's not long? The next box says, what if it isn't long? Metabolic. Then it's metabolic. If it isn't long, it's metabolic. Well, good news. There's really only one scenario where you will answer metabolic alkalosis, and that's what the next fill in the blank says. It says, if the patient has prolonged gastric, gastric, vomiting or suctioning, pick metabolic alkalosis. Why? Why does prolonged gastric vomiting and suctioning lead to metabolic alkalosis? If you're losing acid. If you lose acid, you become basic. Otherwise, everything else that isn't lung, you pick metabolic acidosis. For everything else that isn't lung, that's another fill in the blank, for everything else that is not lung, pick metabolic acidosis. So let me ask you this. A patient had GI surgery. He has had a NG tube to low intermittent gomco suctioning for three days. What acid-base disorder would he most likely exhibit? Metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis. Your patient has hyperemesis gravidarum. What acid-base disorder are they most likely to exhibit? Metabolic, Metabolic alkalosis. Your patient with hyperemesis gravidarum is now dehydrated. What acid-base disorder would they have? Now they've gotten dehydrated. That's not prolonged gastric vomiting suction. It's something you see with it, but it isn't what it is. So now what would they have? Metabolic acidosis. Because that's what caught, yeah, caught it, yeah, it flipped on the other side and now you're there. Good point. <clears throat> what about this? Person has acute renal failure. What acid base disorder? Acute renal failure. What acid base disorder? Metabolic why metabolic acidosis? Why? You're right, but why? Um, Is it lung? No. no. Is it vomiting or suctioning? No. So it's got to be <clears throat> metabolic acidosis. Because everything that isn't lung or vomiting or suctioning is metabolic acidosis. So what about infantile diarrhea? What acid-base disorder? Metabolic acidosis. Why? It's not lung and it's not vomiting. That's the other end. Diarrhea. Okay. Uh, what about uh, third-degree burns over 60% of the body? Third degree burns over 60% of the body, first phase. What? Absolutely, metabolic acidosis, because it's not what? Lung, and it's not vomiting or suction. Okay, what do you, what acid-base disorder do you see with idiopathic bullus pemphigus? <laughs> hmm? What? Yeah, metabolic acidosis. Very good. <laughs> Why? Uh, I mean, I don't know what it is. It is long, though. But if it is long, it's, I mean, you know, it's only, you got one body system out of 13. <laughs> right? And if it's vomit suction, you've got one out of a thousand symptoms. So when you don't know what it is, what's your answer? Absolutely, metabolic acidosis. In everybody, right now, right now, as you're sitting there, I want you to set your default setting for answering acid-base questions to metabolic acidosis. Okay, everybody, do it. Okay, do it. So that when you, I, what do I never want to hear? I never want to hear you guys go. Oh, I don't know what acid-base disorder is because I've never heard of that disease. That's when you absolutely do know what it is. <laughs> it's what? Metabolic acidosis. I've used that word, that rule for 20 years. I take the SD twice a year. I take ATIs. I take Kaplan junk. No, stop. 
should be shelf. <laughs> Kaplan quality materials. And I do, I, I do every book that's published, everything that's there, I do that. Why do I do it? It's my job to prepare for you guys. You know what I mean? I, should, I better know what's out there, and I better know what's current, and I better know what's, how, to, how it's being tested. So I've done, if, if it's been published, I've done it. I've even been to the NCSBN site and done their questions. So um, I know what these questions, and every time I don't know on an acid-based question, what does Mark Clemick pick? And he's 100% right ever since. <laughs> I have never missed a question using that. All right? So let me ask you this. What do you have to know for acid base? Well, what you have to know is if the pH and the bicarb are both in the same direction, it's metabolic. As the pH goes, so goes my patient, except for potassium. Matt Kuzmol, overventilate, underventilate, translate, vomiting or suction, metabolic alkalosis, everything else, metabolic acidosis. If I don't know what to pick, metabolic acidosis. That's acid base. That's all you have to know. So say it with me. If the, come on, get, get it. Okay, if the pH and the bicarb are both in the same direction, it's metabolic. As the pH goes, so goes my patient, except for potassium. Who's your favorite Scotsman? Okay. Overventilate, underventilate, translate. What do I mean by that? Overventilate, underventilate, translate. Yeah, translate the word. Overventilate is respiratory alkalosis. Resp uh, underventilate is respiratory acidosis. If it's vomiting or suctioning, pick. Metabolic alkalosis for everything else, pick. Metabolic acidosis, and when you don't know what to pick, pick. Yeah, I use that all the time. Those that, that works for you. Okay, those are helpful tools that work. All right, yes? So this one, just to make this clear, that one question you asked, if you have severe vomiting and you've gotten dehydrated now, that you look at the de dehydration. Dehydration, right. So now it's right. Metabolic. There's a rule in test taking. So is, watch what they're asking. Yeah. When you want to get a question right, you always pay more attention to the modifying phrase than the original noun. Did everybody hear that? You always pay more attention to the modifying phrase than the original noun. Do you see what I'm saying? So a person with obsessive compulsive disorder who is now psychotic, what's more important? Psychotic, psychotic than obsessive compulsive. Do you see what I'm saying? A patient with vomiting who is now dehydrated. The dehydrated takes precedence over. So the modifying phrase trumps original noun. And people get caught on that every time. Boku questions. They, they crash and burn on that. Because they're focusing on original noun. It's gone past original noun. It's now modifying phrases what the question's about. Good question. Okay, let's talk about ventilators and we'll take a break. Ventilators. The first two things you have to know is the alarms. You have to know the alarm systems. And you have to know how the, how the blood gases articulate with ventilators. There is a thing called a high pressure alarm. A high pressure alarm is triggered by increased resistance to airflow. Increased resistance to airflow. In other words, the machine is having to push too hard to get the air into the lungs. It's having to push too hard. There's resistance. And when that happens, the machine will set off a high pressure alarm. Because you understand, when you, when you set up a vent, you set up two alarms. You say, I don't want you to use less than this pressure to get that air in, and I don't want you to use any more than that pressure. You tell it that. And then when it exceeds that, the high pressure alarm goes up. See, if you set the high pressure at 40 millimeters of mercury, and you say, I don't want you to push, machine, I don't want you to push any more than 40 millimeters of mercury to get that air in. If the machine has to, it will set off the high pressure alarm because it's telling you it's too hard. I'm having to work too hard because it's high pressure. Does everybody understand that conceptually? Okay, now, what would it be due to? Well, obstructions. There are three obstructions. Number one, kinks in the tubing. The tubing could be kinked. Would that increase resistance? Mm -hmm. Sure. So what do you do for that? 
That's rocket science, unkink. Okay. Then, second most common obstruction is water condensing within the tube. There's water condensing in the dependent loops. So what do you do for that? Another more rocket science here. Empty it. And the third most common cause is mucus secretions in the airway. They've got goop there. Gunk. Junk. Mucus. And what do you do for that? Now what will be... Suction is correct, but what would you do before you suction? And I'm not talking about pre-oxygenating them, because that is true, but, but is there another strategy that would be done to mobilize secretions before you would actually suction the person? What would you do? Yeah, change position, turn, cough, deep breathe. Change position, turn, cough, deep breathe. So you would do that first, and if that didn't work, what would you do? Suction. What do you guys know about suctioning airways? What do you think? Good, bad, otherwise, what, what do you think? Give me your impression. The more you do it, the more secretions and problems you cause. So it's a double-edged sword. So how often do you suction patients? Every 15 minutes, every hour, every two hours, every four hours, or none of the above? None of the above. How often do you suction people? As necessary. And that means when they cannot mobilize it after they've been turned and coughed and deep breathed. In ICU, I'm notorious for beginning. Nurses always negatively talk about me in ICUs because I don't do much suctioning, but I do an awful lot of turning. And I find if somebody's O2 sat's low and they're tacking and they're looking like they need, and they, I don't get good air exchange and the high pressure alarms are going off all the time, I turn them. Patient coughs and whack, you know, out comes this thing, hits the wall on the other side, <laughs> you know, and then they pink up and they're just fine, thank you, and I never did suction them. And, and I'll go and report and they'll say, how many times did you suction him? Well, I didn't suction him at all. How come you never suction people? Well, his O2 sat is 98 on room air. You got a problem with this? You just got to say his lungs are clear. He's got 98 on room air. Temperature's normal. You got a problem? Okay. So I, I, I do a lot of turning, man. I do a lot of turning and coughing and deep breathing. And I find I don't have to do a whole lot of suction. Some people, yeah, but not as much. Okay, so that would be a click and drag. What do I mean by a click and drag? Order. What would you do first? High pressure alarm goes off. What do you do first? What do you click first? Unkink. Check for kinks and unkink. Click it, drag it, drop it. Then what would you grab second? Empty water out of tubing. Click, drag, drop. Then what? Turn, cough, deep breathe. Click, drag, drop, then what? Suction, click, drag, drop. That would be your order. Turn the page and let's talk about low pressure alarms. What's this saying? Decreased resistance. Remember I told you you always set a low level and if it is below that, there's decreased resistance. So what's the machine saying? If that was too, too easy, yeah. I had to work too little. That was way too easy, pushing that breath in. Well, what do you think would cause a low pressure alarm? Decreased resistance. Disconnections. There are two disconnections you need to know about. The first one is disconnection of the main tubing. If the main tubing is disconnected, what do you do? Yeah, it's more rocket science. Reconnect. The other most common disconnection is the oxygen sensor tubing. What is the oxygen sensor tubing? What is that? Anybody know? It senses the level. It senses the FiO2 right at the trach area or the airway area. Oh, what, what's it look like? Anybody know what it, what it is? It comes from the ventilator machine. It's a wire, a black coated wire. It's very small. It's probably about half the diameter of your uh, uh, pencil or pen that you're using there. And it goes right along the tubing, piggybacking it, along the tubing, and it comes right to right where the trach or the endo tube is, and it kind of just hooks. It kind of, that, it's like a, do you, ever, uh, do you have a computer 
where you, when your battery's low, you take the cord and you hook that little cord in there. It makes a right angle. You have one like that. Well, it's like that. It hooks into that hole in the tubing and it measures the FiO2, the oxygen delivered right there. But if that pops off, when the air comes in, what's it do? It goes out that tube instead of into them and there's less resistance. Do you see how that would work? So what you have to just take that sensor and plug it back in. Because so many nurses, it'll be going bong, 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 low pressure, and they're going, but it's connected, it's connected, and here's the wire hanging down, and they don't see it. So reconnect the main tubing, then reconnect the oxygen sensor. Those are the two most common problems. So in general, what are high pressure alarms due to? In general, obstructions. In general, what are low pressure alarms due to? Disconnections. And LPNs, this is the same as RNs. You understand the RN test the LPN is the same information. It's just from a different perspective. For example, like an RN question would say, you have the following four patients, which one would you assign to an LPN? The LPN question would say, that you have the following four patients, which one would you accept as an assignment from an RN? It's the exact same four people, just looking at it the other way. Do you see what I'm saying? So you really do, LPNs and RNs need to know basically the same kinds of things. They just need to know the difference in the scope of their practice. Um, in some ways, no, I won't go there. Okay. Um, what about acid-base disorders? Respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis means the ventilator settings may be to what? Why did you say that? We can turn respiratory alkalosis into another word. What can we turn it into? Respiratory. Ventilate. Alkalosis. Over. Over. So then you write and read it. Overventilating means the ventilator settings may be to... See how easy it is? All you do is take these acid-base disorders, turn them into just normal words, and the answer will jump off the page at you. So what is the other word for respiratory acidosis? Underventilate. So underventilating means the settings are too low. Do you got that? Now how would this be applied in a question? And this will do this question, then go to a break. The doctor says we off vent in AM. Got it? He's writing it today for tomorrow. Wean the patient off the ventilator in the morning tomorrow. The 6 a.m. ABGs show respiratory acidosis. What would you do? A. Follow the order. B. Call respiratory therapy. C. Hold the order. Call doctor. Or D. Begin to decrease the settings. What would you do? Talk to your buddy. And LPNs, it would be wherever it says, wherever it says call doctor, you can put notify RN. you know C. He's underventilating. How do you know he's underventilating? He's got respiratory acidosis. So does he need this ventilator? Oh yeah, he does. Because he's being underventilated on the ventilator. He's on the ventilator and he's already underventilated on the ventilator. Am I going to take him off the ventilator? It's going to be even worse. 
So what acid-base disorder did you want to see at 6 a.m.? Respiratory alkalosis, which means he's being overventilated. In that case, he probably doesn't need the ventilator. So is this hard or easy? Do you guys, re how, an hour ago, if I told you you've got to get a bunch of questions on ventilators and acid-base and how you use your acid-base imbalances to know what to do with ventilators, how many would be going, oh my goodness. Okay, how many of you see it's not really hard? It's very simple. Very, very easy. You can be whiz bangs at this. Why is B a bad answer? Why is B a bad answer? What's that? Yeah, never, never, never pick an answer where you don't do something and somebody else has to do something. Is there, I, you may feel like doing that, but that isn't the answer. Okay, that's that stuff what I call the chicken answer. You know, you're trying to, you're afraid to call so you have respiratory therapy do it. If a patient says to you, I have cancer. I only have six months to live. Do you think there's a heaven or a hell? Where do you think I'll go when I die? What would you do? Do not pick, call chaplain. <laughs> now you may not feel like you want to deal with that right then and right there, but as a nurse, you're supposed to say what? What do you think about it. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, you're going to hell. How's that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Don't tell anybody it's Cedarville I said that. Okay, <laughs> uh, okay take a 10-minute break. You guys have been really good.